I love that so many of you are here. This is so exciting. Um, so thanks for coming. I'm so excited to be in conversation with my homeboy, my close, close, close friend, Jason Reynolds, who is so brilliant. Um, and we're going to start with Jason reading to you from Lou. So we'll, we'll get started with the book. I just want to say really quickly, um, it's good to see y'all. It's been a long time since I've done anything in New York, which is weird. My, I don't know why my publishing company and my publisher, she's in here. I, mean, I don't know why they don't put make me do stuff in New York. You know, so it's just good to be here. It's good to see so many people. It's also good to be done with the track series. I got to tell you, I'm happy this is over. And, and, so, I, and so I really hope y'all love this book because there ain't no more coming. All right. All right. I know. It's over. I'm sorry. People are like, what do you mean? What about Coach's story? Uh, <laughs> Not happening. <laughs> All right. So I, I, uh, I read a bit of the first chapter just to give you guys... Um, Sort of, you know, you can feel his voice. You can understand who he is. You'll also find out about if Sonny, want, how he did at the discus thing. If you read Sonny, uh, yeah, I'll just read the first. I'll read the first chapter. It's short. It's cool. Yeah. And then we'll we'll, we'll dive into some things. All right, here we go. Chapter one. My name, Lightning. I am the man. The guy, the kid, the one, the only. Oh, by the way, real quick before I finish. If you have a book, do not read along. <laughs> the reason why is because those of us who write these books never, we edit. We have to edit. We don't actually like the way that, you know, it's like it's been a while, you know. And so I'm going to give you the edited version of this first chapter. So I want you to enjoy it. If you read it, you're going to be confused about why your words don't sound like the words that I'm saying. So do not read the book. Just listen to what I have to say. <laughs> All right, here we go. I am the man, the guy, the kid, the one, the only, the Lou. Lucky Lou. Or as I call myself, Lucky Lou, or as my mom calls me, Lou, the lightning bolt, because lightning's so special, it don't never happen the same way or at the same place twice. That's what she says. And I like the nickname, but I don't believe that. Don't believe lightning won't hit the same tree or the same house or the same person more than once. I think mom might have missed on that one. I swear, sometimes she just be talking to be talking. Plus, how would she even know that? I mean, she know a lot of stuff about stuff because she's a mother and mothers gotta know stuff, but the people who went to school for that kind of thing, like weather people and meteorologists who should be studying meters and not weather, they don't even be knowing. <laughs> They don't even be knowing because they should be studying meters, medias and not weather. Talking about it's a 50% chance it might rain a little, a lot, today or maybe tomorrow. I mean, come on. And I'm supposed to just believe that lightning don't never strike the same place twice, ever? Right. You know who really made me know my mother was wrong? Ghosts. One time, he told me about this guy, named Start with an R, who holds the world record for getting struck by lightning, not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, not five times, not six times, but seven times. If I was Ray or Ron or whatever his name is or was, because he gotta be dead, I would have stayed in the house after the second one. I mean, what was he thinking? Sure. Knowing him, I don't really know him, but I know people like him, so that's basically the same thing. <laughs> Knowing him, he was probably listening to a meteorologist <laughs> or my mother, who, by the way, when she says the thing about lightning striking, don't even be talking about real lightning, <laughs> like electric bolts in the sky. Nah, she just be talking about electric moments in life. And I clearly was the most electricist moment in hers. One in 17,000 albino, born with no melanin, which means born with no brown. And honestly, I wasn't supposed to be born at all because my mom wasn't supposed to be able to have kids. So a two time special, once in a lifetime thing. Until yesterday. It was Sunday dinner. 
which is the same as Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday dinner, except mom always tries something new with the food. And this Sunday, my dad, who normally works late, was there at the table with my mom to drop the new news on me. We're having another baby. They almost sang it out like a song hook or something, like they one, two, three, did and everything. <laughs> you for real? That's all I could really get out, let out. But inside my head was going, yo, you serious? Like really for real, real talk, no joke, stop playing. It ain't funny if you playing, wait, wait, now nah, can't be. You really, really, really for real? Stretching my neck, trying to see my mother's stomach, even though she was sitting down. Dad was tucking his gold chains in his shirt. He always did that whenever he was eating, then popped me on the arm with the back of his hand. And when I looked at him, wondering what he did it for, he just shook his head real fast like he knew something I ain't know, like he knew something I ain't want to find out. Sorry, I yelped. I just, I can't even tell. I pinched and pulled a piece of meat from the turkey wing on my plate, a recipe my mom says she got from Patty's aunt. Tasted pretty good too, even though it seemed weird to just be eating turkey wings without the rest of the turkey. I mean, that's what chicken wings are for. <laughs> we're very, for <laughs> we're very for real, mom smiled. We're just about at three months and they're saying on December 6th, you're gonna have a little brother or sister. I swear her face was glowing like there were light bulbs in her cheeks. That's why I've been more tired than usual and why I'm sometimes late picking you up at practice. Been a little sick during the day. Sick? Yeah, yeah, nothing serious, just normal pregnancy stuff, but that part should be almost over. She crossed her fingers. And, and well, Thank you for not being able to tell by looking at me. Trust me, I'll be poking out soon enough. You know, it took a while for you to make your presence known too. And the boy ain't stopped since, my dad threw in. Ain't that the truth? Mom pressed her shirt against her stomach just enough to show a bump no bigger than the kind you get after a Thanksgiving meal. Only difference is it wasn't Thanksgiving, even though turkey, you know. <laughs> anyway. We're telling you now because tomorrow we have a doctor's appointment. I'm going? I mean, well, we thought about it, but it's your championship week, you know? She set her fork down, folded her arms on the table. I mean, you wanna go or would you rather go to practice? Tricky. I definitely wanted to go to the doctor to see what was going on with the baby, but not if they did what I thought they were gonna do there. Depends, they gonna do that thing with the I balled up my fist and slowly moved it over my stomach to demonstrate how they pull out that machine thing that turns the baby into a blob of virtual reality with a heartbeat and all of that. <laughs> and then the baby will show up on the screen looking like old footage of the moon landing. <laughs> a blob of virtual reality or old school TV when TV was basically just radio with a screen. Dad <laughs> choked on his drink, a sonogram. My mother put a name to my brilliant description. And when have you ever seen footage of the moon landing? Ghost showed me. Well, really, Ghost asked Patty to pull it up on the phone because he was trying to convince us that it never happened. He heard these dudes at the bus stop saying it was all fake. Patty says she got a friend whose dad is a rocket science. I didn't even know that was a real job and that she could prove that the moon landing was real. And Sonny, well, he just said he already knew it was real, the moon landing, the moon walk, because he had been up there to the moon, and that's what he said. Too bad his discus ain't never go to the moon. Sonny couldn't get that thing to go far enough to land any place other than last place. A few weeks ago, at the first meet he ever threw, yes. yes. <laughs> A few weeks ago at the first meet he ever threw at, he stepped over the line on the first two tries. Me, Patty, and Ghost started cheering for him, like just trying to make sure he ain't feel bad because he was looking pretty rough out there. Even his pops joined in with the encouragement, and then everybody started clapping and screaming, go Sonny, and come on Sonny, and you can do it, and all that kind of stuff. Even some people from the other team. Sonny dropped back in his throwing position and started winding up. His face looked more intense than I'd ever seen it like a stone he wound and wound and wound then whipped into a spin and right when he flung the discus he let out a sound like I don't even know like a, a whale like a whale it was wild and the discus went maybe I don't know 10 feet maybe I mean the thing went nowhere but he got it off without a foul and was cheesing from ear to ear and we all were he threw his hands up in the air broke out in some kind of weird dance move and everything last place but there were only three people competing, so good for him because last place was still third place. 
So yeah, they going to sonogram the baby? I went on. Yep, to make sure everything is beaten and growing. My mother wiggled her fingers in the air, and even though I couldn't see her feet, I knew she was wiggling her toes too. And you going to find out if it's a boy? Uh, or a girl, she corrected me. Right, right, or a girl. Mom looked at dad, then back at me, nodded, smiling. That was a yes. Well then, I'm going to practice. <laughs> Why? My mother looked shocked like I said I was going to the moon or something. So that y'all can come home and surprise me. I love surprises. I always have. My folks used to give me surprise birthday parties every year when I was younger, and even though I was never really surprised because they did it every year, I was still happy they did it until I asked them to just start surprising me with sneakers for my birthday so then I could surprise the world. My father be surprising my mom all the time with like flowers and husband wife stuff, and my mother surprises us with stuff like turkey wings. <laughs> I mean, for real, for real, this pregnancy was a surprise. Maybe the biggest one ever. Like, boom, Lou, you having a little brother or a sister. Surprise! <laughs> okay. My father caught eyes with my mother, and again, like they rehearsed it, they both shrugged. Well, obviously, neither of us will be able to get you from practice, and we figured you'd want to be there. So we've already made arrangements for, um, he cleared his throat, for coach to bring you home. I nodded, nibbling on the knobby end of the turkey bone. But it's exciting news, right? My mother's smile looked like it could split the whole bottom half of her face. <laughs> yeah. I wiped grease from my mouth with the back of my hand. But it's a little, I don't know. It's, I just thought, I know, my dad cut me off, put his fingertips on top of my mother's fingertips. We did too. What I was about to say was that I thought mom couldn't have no more kids. That's what she always said. That's what they always said. That's what the doctors always said. That's what they said the doctors always said. <laughs> According to them, I was a miracle. I wasn't even supposed to be born. So another baby was almost impossible. A miracle with some extra miracleness sprinkled on it. Magic, lightning, striking, twice. All right. Uh, it's my first time reading that thing. That was fabulous. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you about, first of all, um, I love what you said to the audience about not reading along because we always rewrite our books even long after they're published. Uh, so how, how many times did you rewrite Lou? Oof, Lou, oof. Lou was work. You know, I rewrote Lou probably, I don't know, I think we went back and forth maybe eight, nine times, um, rewriting it, rewriting it, rewriting it, because I understood that I had to figure out how to not just tell Lou's story, but I had to tell everybody's story, mm -hmm. right? Like, this was sort of the last book, and I needed to make sure that I didn't get a whole bunch of young people mad and being like, yo, but what about this? What about that? What happened to Sonny? What happened to Patty? How's her mom? How's her stepmom? How's Sonny's dad? How's Ghost Mom? How it's like all these sort of things. What about Coach? What's up with Coach? And so I needed to figure out how to tell Lou's story and have Lou be the center of this story and also really sort of round out the world for everybody as I sort of close out the series without without being condescending or without sort of tying things up in a bow, but definitely answering some of the important questions. And so it was super difficult because I never created an outline for the series. <laughs> I just sort of wrote ghosts and then tried to figure out how to write Patina and then tried to figure out how to make that work with Sonny. And so now I had this sort of pile of stories with a bunch of loose ends and I gotta figure out how to tell this kid's story and tie those loose ends up. So it was really, really hard. If I could do it all over again, I probably would have started this whole thing with an outline. I'm just not that organized. Um, and so it took eight, nine, maybe 10, 10 edits of back and forth trying to figure out how to make it work. Yeah. Wow. And how did, how did you get to Lou? I mean, how did, how did you decide that he was going to be albino? How did you do the research about finding out what that meant in terms of yeah. How he moved through the world. Yeah, so I have, I have albino friends, and I'm always just curious about the things that make us um, 
the things that differentiate us uh, and the things that sort of create opportunity for other people to, to, to judge us and oust us and marginalize people who already exist within marginalized communities. I, think that's, I just think it's fascinating, right? What does it mean to be black and woman, right? Uh, which is an obvious one, which is, which is ridiculous, but it's true, right? Let alone, what does it mean to be black and woman with a cleft lip? Right? We're talking about like the, the constant marginalization, this, this sort of, the subsets that we tend to put people in. And so for me, with this particular story, it was like, well, I wanna know what does it feel like to, to write about a kid who has something different about them? It could have been, it could have been, you know, uh, Down syndrome. Right? It could have been, uh, it could have been a lot of things. Uh, he could have been, he could have easily been needles from when I was the greatest, you know. But just trying to figure out how can I write, but to use his skin color was very specific for me because I wanted to talk about what it must feel like to be a black boy with white skin who identifies with being a black boy, but who has a target on him by his black friends because he has white skin. Uh, and to deal with the complexities of, of that was really, I mean, the one thing that they say makes us black is melanin, mm-hmm. and he don't have it, mm-hmm. right? And so, like, what are the other things that he uses to sort of overcompensate for that? Yeah, so. So did you have to do a lot of um, research around albinoism? Oh, yeah. For sure. I mean, but I've been working on an albino character for a long time. It just so happened that it fit with this particular book. But I, my, my homeboy, Jermaine, used to live down the street from me in Brooklyn. And uh, I, I used to pick his brain all the time about, like, what is... And he would always tell me, yo, it was rough for me growing up in Brooklyn, New York, because I was out, not only was I albino, but my albinism made it impossible for me to see, right? Because that's, it affects your eyesight. So he couldn't see, so he was legally blind. And he couldn't hear. Wow. So he was legally blind and he was legally deaf. So he was a, an albino kid that they had to take out of Brooklyn Public Schools and send him to a school, school for the deaf, right? So he went to a school for the deaf. Here he is, this albino kid who can't see either. Um, and then had to come back to his neighborhood and deal with just sort of the neighborhood stuff, being that kind of kid. He would tell me about how, how all of his like Caribbean friends would like call him Yellow Man, which is a reggae, a reggae star, right? Or they would say that, you know, different, different cultures have all these different lores around albinism. Like, oh, well, you are, you know, all this sort of negative lore about what happens if you don't have melanin in your skin, right? You're cursed, you're this, you're that. And he would just say how difficult it was to, because to him on the inside, he was just a regular Brooklyn kid who just wanted to be a regular Brooklyn kid and all the things he had to do to overcompensate for that. If Jermaine walked in this room right now, and Jermaine is like the most diesel dude I've ever known, right? He's like super buff and like, you know, and, and I always wonder if some of that comes from the force field that we have to use to protect ourselves from the insults. It's the same thing that black kids do all the time with like the sneakers we wear, the clothes we wear, the way we talk, rapping on the train all loud, right? It ain't because we really love the song. It's because I'm trying to keep you away. I'm trying to make sure you, this is a force field I've created for myself, right? We all have a way of doing that. And, I, and I, I, for him, it was, you know, hitting the weights. Mm-hmm. You know, for, for Lou, it's the clothes that he wears and him teasing everybody and, and, and being a bit of a bully. I'm interested in how you get to your girls and your women. Yeah. Uh, I think you do it so beautifully and lovingly. And I know your mom, and I know how much you love your mom, mm-hmm. and I know she beat you behind if you've mm-hmm. made some bad characters. But, but what is your process for getting to the depth in those characters? You know, writing, writing young women, writing women in general, uh, for me, it's always... It, for me, it's always funny, right? Because I, I've, when, when I wrote Patina, there was all this sort of fuss about, like, you know, I would get on Twitter, which is the worst place ever for everything. But I, uh, right, exactly. <laughs> so I would get on Twitter, right, and, uh, you know, people would be talking about, like, well, let's see if Jason can write a, a, a girl protagonist. It was all this sort of chatter about, like, let's see. Let's see if he can write a girl protagonist, which for me was, like, a bit of a slap in the face and because I have written so many girl characters in all the books, but you know, a girl, can he lead a story? Can he write a girl protagonist to lead the story? And I always wanted to, I never tweeted back because I just try to, I ain't got time for the, I just don't have time for it. But, and these were always women, these were always women who were like, I wonder, can he write a girl protagonist? And I always wanted to tweet back. You know, the messed up thing about this is that you asking me this question is actually you assuming that girls are anything other than human beings. Right? Because the truth is, is that to write a girl and to write a woman is to write a person first and foremost. Mm-hmm. 
it's just writing a, a person, right? W women and girls want the same things. Like Patina really wanted the exact same thing that Ghost wanted. Security, comfort, taking care of, of her, her parents and her sister the same way he took care of his mother. Nothing is really that different about it. It's just the details that change, right? Because the world and the context has to create different details because obviously Patina has to carry different weight, unfortunately, because she is a girl in America, right? And the way that America sort of socializes young women is that, unfortunately, they have more responsibilities than young men do. They have all this sort of nonsense, unfortunately, that we put on young women, which is why I wrote Patina the way I did, right? And and in, in Lou, it's the same thing. I mean, you get to see all these characters that are, that are women, his mother, and it's the same thing. I just want to write stories about women and girls who are human first, who are human first, right? Who want basic human things. Um, and if I can humanize them, then I, then I really, really lessen the margin for error. I think what happens is we use them as symbols, we use them as functions, right? How can I put a girl in my book as a function to get me to this other space? There has to be a love interest, so I'll plop a girl in the book, quote unquote, if it even has to be a boy-girl love interest, right? But I'll plop this girl in the book as a way to sort of get me through the girl to the finish line, which is where I'm really trying to go, and I think that's nonsense. Instead, you could say, look, I'm trying to write whole characters, whole people, and girls are whole people, and I want to write them as such. It's, it's really that, I don't, there's nothing deep about it, I, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jason. So I wanted to um, take some questions from the audience, because yeah, I know y'all have some. Um, and I think we have some microphones. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak for Jason and myself in saying nothing you can ask is wrong. For sure. Um, so ask away. And the hand just went up in the way back there. If you could stand up and tell us your name and then ask the question. Just wait for the microphone so we can all hear you. There you go, bud. My, my name is uh, Chris Garcia. I have a question. <laughs> why, why, where did you get the idea of making a book series about ch uh, track races? All right, good question, man, good question. Why, why track? Well, <clears throat> a few reasons. Number one, it was really important for me to not write about basketball, <laughs> right? Um, only, not because I don't think that basketball is a good sport, but because I think we have enough of those books. Honestly, and also Kwame's my man and he's got it covered, right? I'm not, you know, he's, he's, our, he's our guy, you know, Kwame's our guy. Kwame got the basketball thing covered, I'm cool. Walter, Walter Dean Myers, basketball books. Look, there's enough basketball books. Um, and so I knew that I didn't want to write basketball book, football books, too many people, and I'm not a football fan. I mean, I, you know, it's like, I'm not about to write about all of the violence that takes place in football. I'm cool with that. Uh, baseball, I don't really understand the sport well enough, and it's a little boring for me. It's like, uh, you know what I mean? It's like, I got to stand at the, it's like, you know, it's too much, you know? Uh, and so what I realized was that I wanted to write um, a novel, or a series of books about a sport that every single person could play. Right? The difference between hockey and track is that you got to be able to afford pads and sticks and pucks. You got to find ice, right? All of this stuff. For running, all you need is feet, right? Everybody can do the sport. So that was the first thing. The second thing is I wanted to write about how running is the, uh, in order to be good at it, you have to be comfortable with the feeling of suffocation. And I've talked about this in other books. Uh, you have to be comfortable with feeling like you're going to die, because that's what running feels like. That's why, that's why your mother and father don't run, right? Because what we know is it feels terrible, and that's why we don't do it, right? But so, so in order to be good at it, you've got to be comfortable with that feeling, the, the discomfort. You've got to be comfortable with that discomfort. And I wanted to write about how there are kids all around us, kids in our neighborhoods who, are, who have grown comfortable with the feeling of suffocation, kids who don't know what it feels like to breathe easy, Ghost and Lou, and they're all sort of suffocating. Something is suffocating them, and they're just used to it, right? And then lastly, track other than swimming is the only sport where you're only competing with yourself. You're not actually racing the people next to you. They're next to you to motivate you, right? But your coach is only timing your speed. It's you trying to beat you. That's it. And I think these stories are about these young people pushing themselves to be better versions of themselves, and they have a coach there to help encourage them to do so. And that's really what this, this whole series is sort of about. Let me hand this over. Go ahead. We have one on that side. What's your favorite book to read? 
was my favorite book to read. Uh, you know, there's a lot of books in the world. Um, but I'll tell you the one book that I go back to, a few books, right? It depends on, okay, this is a good question, because it really depends on what I'm writing. Sometimes, because you know, I go to books to see, like, oh, let's see who I can steal from, you know what I mean? And so, <laughs> and so like, I read Brown Girl Dreaming, then I wrote Long Way Down, right? <laughs> I was like, let me see how I can. Jackie had this part, hey, you know, that's what it is, right? Like Jackie had this part in, in Brown Girl Dream and it was like, you know, what was it, like writing lessons and you know, and then I was like, oh, I'm gonna do anagrams, right? I'm gonna figure out how to like, I mean, that's what we do though, right? How can I be inspired by the people who I think are better than me, right? And so I, I read Brown Girl Dream and then I was like, I'm gonna go ahead and steal all of this and put this in my own story, right? But then sometimes I read, there's a book called uh, Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward. I think it's one of the greatest books written in the 21st century. I think she's the leader of the pack. You know what I mean? A close second. You know what I mean? But I think Jasmine's a leader of the pack in terms of adult contemporary fiction. And uh, I read that book probably once a year as a reminder that I have so much work to do. You know? We have one over here. Hi, my name is Kevin. Um, what character do you identify with the most? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Which character do I identify with the most? The most. You know, I, I, it's tough. It depends. Different times in my life. Right now, Patina. Like right now, as a 35-year-old man who's taking care of his whole family, mm -hmm. Patina. Um, there have been moments, though, where I've felt like sunny, where I just sort of felt like nobody understands what's happening in here. I feel like that regularly, actually. There are a lot of moments where I wake up in the morning and I'm like, yo, I'm talking to myself, I'm you know, trying to work it all out, and everything sounds a little strange uh, but it, to everybody else, if I say it outside of my head, but I know to me what, it, what these codes and these strange words and sounds mean in my own head, you know? I've been ghost when I was a little boy, you know, even though ghost is based on my friend Matt, a true story, by the way, uh, and I've been Lou, you know, a kid who, who, when I was in high school, had to, had to fight, fight my way to being respected by my peers because I was so small. I was a little teeny guy when I got to high school, like tiny, tiny, tiny person. And I was teased and I was bullied. And then I joined the wrestling team. And then the teasing stopped, right? And I, right. And I, but I had to figure out. And I, and I, I begged my mom for name brand clothes. I begged my mom for name brand clothes so they wouldn't tease me. And my mom would buy name brand clothes on the off season when she could afford them. So I would go to school in the middle of like it's like August, September, and I got on like a coat and a sweater because I wanted to wear all my name brand clothes and boots, right? Because I wanted to be fly, and they were like, bro, you look crazy out here. But I, you know what I mean? But like, so I've been all these characters at one point in my life, um, and I think hopefully that's why they feel so real, because they're coming from real places. These are, and that's the other thing I want you all to know, like Ghost and Patina and Sunny Alu are actually just one person, right? Like, it's a single person, you know? Hey. She'd like to know how long it takes you to write a book. How long does it take to write a book? Well, every book is different. Good question. Every book is different. Uh, Ghost, it took like six weeks. Patina, it took a little over six months. Sunny was only two drafts. I wrote, the, I wrote the first draft and it was horrible. My editor said, I don't think it's working. I don't think the diary entries are working. Write a straight ahead novel. And then I said, please let me try one more time. And I started all over. I erased the whole thing and started from scratch. And what I turned in is what you, what you read. Uh, and then, um, and Lou took, took, Lou took six, seven months as well, you know. But I had a really tight schedule because we had to get all these books out within the course of two and a half years, and so that complicated it. So it was a, it's been a really stressful two and a half years in terms of, of writing, so it, it depends. All right, right here. How do you come up with your characters? How do I come up with the characters? So it's, you know, I, I, I was really lucky as a kid because I grew up around a bunch of colorful people, and they all make their way into these books. Um, so when at the beginning of Ghost, you remember he's like listing off all the people on the team. He's like, oh, there's this kid named Mikey with a, st a face of stone. Oh, there's Aaron. There's Melissa and JJ and Freddie and Chris and, you know, Brit Brat. And these are all like my friends I grew up with. That's, those are their names, everything. Deja, Deja, Crystal Speed, who ain't got no speed, that whole thing. It's my, it's my goddaughter, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like Crystal Speed is my goddaughter. Any of you have ever read The Boy in the Black Suit? You remember there's a part in The Boy in the Black Suit where they go to the funeral of, uh, of a dude named Speedo. 
Speedo is Crystal Speed's father. The real Speedo is Crystal Calvin Speed is his real name. What's his real name? Crystal Speed's father. So these are all my friends and family members that I just put in these books because they are interesting enough. Um, I've been really, I've been really lucky to grow up around a, a bunch of people who are outrageous as human beings and perfect for novels. Yeah. Do you have a question? Um, why did you choose the same race for every single character? And why did I choose? The, why did I choose the same race? Yeah. They don't all run the same race. They all run different races. So. No, I mean, no, I, I mean, not not like um, like actual running. I mean, like the actual race color. The actual. Different. Oh, the race. The. I'm sorry. <laughs> the actual color of their skin, like their race. That's a good question. I was like, why did they choose the same race? I'm like, um, why did I choose the same race? Why did I choose to make them all the same race, the same um, color of skin? That's a very good question that no one's ever asked. Uh, and the answer, um, unfortunately, is going to be so much more simple uh, than I wish. The truth is, is that I grew up a black kid. And, and what I wish I would have seen more of was black kids in books. And even now, when I think about black kids in books, people are really afraid of just putting black kids in books. It's like, we gotta make sure that he got a white girlfriend. We gotta make sure that he's got this person in the book. This is just real, I'm just gonna be, this is, I, I respect you, so I wanna make sure you understand where I'm coming from. Um, and so for me, it's very important to just have black kids in the book and for that to be okay. And not just, not just for, for me, but to show the publishing industry that Black kids in a book can still be successful, that all races of young people can still read these books, um, even if their, their race isn't represented. It doesn't, mean that it doesn't mean that your identity is not there. You relate to some of these characters, right? So I, I think this is what I'm trying to prove, not just to me, because I know y'all good with it. I know y'all can handle it. I'm fully aware that this does not bother you, right? <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure the publishing company understands that this is not a thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jason, right down here. Um, for both of you, actually, what was your favorite book to write, and why was it your favorite book I'm to so write? I'm so glad you asked Jackie a question. <laughs> I'm like, y'all crazy to let this, this legend sit on stage <laughs> and not ask nothing. I know we're supposed to be promoting the book and all of that, but like, <laughs> she is who she is. And she is the ambassador, <laughs> the national ambassador. <laughs> So you should answer. You said what book was the? What was what was my favorite book to write and why? Um, you know, I have a love hate relationship with every book I write. Uh, I think that they they all start out being my favorite. By the middle of them, I hate them, and then I'm really in love with them again when I write the last line. Uh, I think the book that's closest to my heart is Brown Girl Dreaming because it's um. You know, it's my life and it's my family. And like Jason was saying about um, getting the people you love into the book and, and seeing how interesting they are on the page. Uh, so it's, and then in um, the middle of writing it, my mom died suddenly. So it's a, this way of kind of carrying my mom with me. Um, and I think um, Harbor Me, just because it really made me have to stretch my brain in this way um, after the 2016 election to find where the hope was in young people and you guys and, and tell that story. Harbor me in stores now. Um, uh, for me, I think my favorite book, honestly, my favorite book to write, like the most fun I had sort of writing was probably Ghost uh, and, uh, or Sunny. I had Sunny, maybe, maybe even Sunny more, because I got to use a part of my imagination that I rarely get to use on the page. I got to make up words. I got to put sounds on, on the page. I got to move the world, words around and just and, and, and figure out how to tell a story with one character, but build everybody's character around him in a way that felt very real and very familiar to him. So that was probably like the most fun I had writing a novel, for sure. Oh, oh, what about as brave as you? Miserable time. I love the novel, probably the best thing I've ever written, but it was, it almost took me out of here. It almost took me out of here. Um, hi, my name is Paloma. Um, so I want to ask a question that in Ghosts, you mentioned a lot the sunflower seeds. Mm. Um, can you clarify a little bit, like, um, what, what does it symbolize? How, uh, what do they mean to ghosts and stuff? What does it symbolize? 
See, y'all got, you gotta trust the young people. You gotta trust the young people. They be knowing. She knows it symbolizes something, <laughs> right? She's smart enough to know it symbolizes something. So I'm glad you asked. Here's, so here's the answer. Here's the answer, Paloma, here's the answer. The sunflower seeds, uh, funny enough, everything you need to know about ghosts you learn in that first scene with the sunflower seeds. Um, him taking his time and sort of going through the whole process of like, I'm gonna take my time and crack the shell and do all this, is actually you, sh you seeing and you learning implicitly, subconsciously, that this kid is like, he's, he's, he's caring and he's patient and he's, he's diligent and he's, uh, I mean, he's, like, think about what that takes, right? Think about a young person saying, look, I could chew the whole thing up, I could suck the salt off, or I could take my time and figure out how to crack the shell, how, how to do this, you know, how, how to do this, quote unquote, the, the professional way. Um, but the other thing, Paloma, that I really wanted to do, it's actually a jab at adults, right? And so I know that adults read these books. I know teachers read these books. And so really the sunflower seeds was me sort of sticking a knife at the adults, right? And, and here's what I mean. As adults, we get to make a decision on about one, what kind of sunflower seed we, eater we are. And, and this is in direct relationship to our children, the ones that we teach, the ones that we raise, right? Our, or the ones in our neighborhoods, right? You can be the kind of adult that chews the sunflower seed up. It just crunches, crunches the shell, crunches everything up, and then spits it all out. You take in none of it. You just sort of abuse the seed, right? You just crunch it up, crunch it up because you're too lazy to do anything else. And then you spit it all out and make a mess of things. Or you could be the adult who just sucks the salt off the seed and spits the whole seed out. If you are a black or brown kid who goes to a wealthy white school, this could be your experience, right? The idea that, they, that, you, that you can be taken advantage of for what you bring to a space, but not actually seen or appreciated for who you actually are. I know a lot of kids who go to the Calhoun School, who go to all these different schools, and this is just real talk. Right, and they're like, "Yo, I'm here because I play basketball, or I'm here because this, that, and the third. But I don't necessarily feel seen in my classrooms. I don't necessarily feel appreciated for who I actually am as a person. Um, they just use me for what I bring, for the diversity posters, for all this other stuff. Right? That is a reality. Or you could be the kind of adult that Jacqueline Woodson is." And you could take your time, you can move the seed around, you can wait for the moment so when you find the perfect crease, you can bite down gently, you can then, using your tongue, remove the seed from the shell, protect it under your tongue while you then discard the shell, right? That's the kind of adults that everybody needs. That's the kind of adults that we all should be for our young people. So the sunflower seeds was really me saying, hey adults, this is for you, I know you're reading. Right? That's why he says, my father did this. My father chewed the whole seed up. That's the reason he says it's his father, right? And how he doesn't do it that way. You know, good question. Back left. Hi, my name is Tyler. Um, if you could be one character in like the whole book, which yeah. character would you be? If I could be one character in the whole book, which character would I be? Probably Coach. I love Coach. I love Coach. I feel like there are moments in my life where I feel like Coach, where I show up to a school or I show up to a prison, and it's just like the track team, and everybody's talking crazy and they're talking trash, right, and being slick, and and, and we and, and my job is not to shut that down. My job is to help them find value in all of that, and I. I, those are the moments that I value most about this career, right? Like, we, yes, we do the work. Yes, we write these books. Yes, we tell stories. But when I'm sitting around a bunch of young people of all backgrounds and we're laughing and joking about whether or not I play Fortnite or whether or not, you know, you know how to shoot and how to, you know, all these sort of things and not shoot a gun, shoot the dance. They know what I'm talking about. And how, to, how I, if I could do all these sort of things that they can do and having that kind of discourse and then listening to them tell me their truths and their stories about where they come from and what they've been through, I think those are the moments where I feel like I'm coaching that cab, right? And I'm taking them on some journey, um, but really it's them taking me on one. And I, I think coach's life has been enriched by these kids, right? He's not, he's not the one who's like, I've made your lives better. And you'll read when you read Lou, you'll understand what I'm, what I'm saying. Coach is the one who's really being fortified by these young people. You know? That's how I feel. Okay. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ioni Paulino. Um, how does these group of kids, or do these group of kids show something related to you? How do these group of kids show something related to me? I think all of these young people in, these book, in this book and all these books um, are, I think, I think what, what, what we're reading in these, in these novels are young people who 
a whole, a whole, right? And I think sometimes when adults talk about kids, we talk about them, we talk about you all as if you're half-formed things, right? It's like, oh, you're just, you're just a child. When the reality is each of you sort of possesses an entire world on the inside, right? You're complete in this moment. You are a complete pe person. And you will change into a different complete person as you get older, but every step of the way you will be completed in that form, right? And I think for me, the way, the way they all connect to me is that I think about sort of myself as someone who in life has been made to feel, you know, less than complete, less than whole, and how it's a certain diligence that young people have. There's a certain curiosity. There's a certain, um, there's a certain, there's a certain arrogance that is so valuable that young people have, this courage, this bravery, this ego that's like, look, I, don't, I know I can hear all the adults telling me that I'm wrong, but boy, do I feel right. And so I'm gonna hold on to this thing. I'm gonna hold on to it. And look, here's the thing, right? You will learn later on that some of the things that they said you were wrong about, you actually are wrong about, right? <laughs> But, but, I think it's but I think it's completely okay for you to feel like you're right in this moment. My mother told me when I, when, I, when I moved here to make this whole thing happen, I was 20 years old, I told my mom I was gonna write books for a living and that I was not gonna get a job. And she said, you're gonna need to get a job. And I said, no, 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 because if I get a job, I won't be able to make the publishing meetings, I won't be able to find an agent, I won't be able to do anything else because all of that happens in the middle of the day. And my mom is like, you need, to, you need to feed yourself. So I don't know, you gotta pay your rent, son. You need to get a job. I'm like, I'm gonna do odd jobs. I'm, I was a dog walker, I did all this stuff. I'll do anything I can, but I'm not getting a regular job. And then when I was 26, 27 years old, and, this, and when I was the greatest was getting ready to happen, and I was feeling down and out because I didn't know that when I was the greatest was getting ready to happen, I realized, I realized that my mom wasn't wrong. That what she was trying to tell me was that if you are willing to work eight hours on this craft and this dream that you love, it should mean that nothing will stand in the way. You should be able to work eight hours for somebody else too. If you really want it, you should be able to feed yourself and take care of your rent if you really want it. And when I got it, I called and I said, you were right. And her response was, oh, I was right but I'm so glad you didn't listen. Because the truth is, is that me not having a job is, is what got me here. Me, me, me sticking to what I thought was right and making the mistakes is what got me here. And I think, I think about them in that way, right? There's a certainty to them, there's an uncertainty. They're just, all of them together make me, you know? What was your favorite character? What was my favorite character? My favorite character, it's a lot of them. I mean, like, in Patina, the whole scene with the girls on the track, Crystal, Brit Brat, Deja, I don't know if y'all read Patina, but that scene is like probably the, my favorite scene in all the books. I just love the way that they talk to each other and the way they connected with each other and their ups and their downs because it reminded me of all the girls I grew up with and like, it was just, I love that. Those, are, those three are probably my favorite characters. Also, I really love um, some of the off characters like Aaron, who's sort of a wild kid and I love, uh, you know, I love Co uh, Coach Witt, who you find out a lot more about in this book, who I love. Um, so you'll, you know, I, I, I love a lot of them. So I just have a question. So today is your first day of your book tour. Yep. And can you tell us a little bit about what your book tour is going to look like and just what a book tour is like for the people who don't know? Yeah. I, so I don't, I, I, I have no idea what it's about to be like. I, you know, I, I go week by week. I have no idea. But what I will say is that most book tours, the way it works is, so I'm starting here. I start in New York, which I'm really happy about. Uh, I go to Long Island um, tonight and tomorrow I'll do something in Long Island. Then I have Philadelphia. And basically it'll be me showing up at schools and I'll be giving talks about Lou. We'll probably be talking about all the track books um, since this is the end of the series. Uh, we, it, it's just like this, but it's in several different places. And then I got to do bookstores. I got to do school visits, um, library visits, um, and it's cool. Uh, it's, it's traveling around day after day, new hotels every single day, which I'm sure for many of the young folks are like, that sounds amazing. And to all the adults are like, oof, you know. <laughs> but it's all good. It'll, it'll, listen, at the end of the day, I, I, I feel so grateful to be able to travel around and, and talk about these particular, these books, and I think it's super cool. Yeah. We have time for two more questions, so I'm going to do one over here, and then we'll do one on the other side. Okay. Hi, my name is George, and I have a question for both of you. What, motiv what motivated both of you to start writing books? Mm. So when I was a kid, I talk about how um, I got in trouble for lying a lot. I was always 
telling stories, making up stuff about my life, and I would get in trouble for it. Um, and I had a teacher who said, instead of, write, instead of lying, write it down, because if you write it down, it's not a lie, it's fiction. Uh, and so from the time I was seven, I was saying, I want to be a writer, I want to be a writer. Um, and, and I think I grew up in Bushwick, um, here in, Brook, I mean, in Brooklyn, in the old Bushwick, not the new Bushwick. Um, <laughs> And there weren't writers in my community. I mean, there were people who liked poetry, and it was before rap even, like when I got older, it was the Sugar Hill Gang. And, but there was some spoken word. There was like Nikki Giovanni. Um, we had an album of hers uh, that I would listen to, and I'd be like, wow, what is this? But I always, I knew I wanted to write. I didn't know how I was going to be a writer because I didn't think. Um, black girls from Bushwick grew up to be writers. That, that there was just no mirror in the community that said this is who you could be. I also was a really slow reader. Um, and, but but I, I knew writing was the thing that I loved doing more than anything else. And so, um, and so the truth of it was I didn't have a backup plan. I mean, I, I had jobs that I worked at night and stuff, but I, I, just, I just knew that writing was the thing that brought me the most joy and that I was going to figure out a way to do it, like Jason's mother said. And for me, you know, I, um, I discovered rap music really young. And I, I was lucky because I grew up in, in the 80s and rap music was just sort of growing up with me, basically. And it was amazing to sort of be, be around and watch that music grow. And I, and I loved it. And so I started writing poetry when I was 10 years old. And I got really lucky in a strange way because my, my grandmother died uh, shortly after I started to write poetry. And it was the first time that I'd heard my mom cry. And it's weird, right? Anybody in here who's ever heard your mother cry, it's the strangest, it's a weird experience. I don't know what it is, it's a really strange experience to hear your mother cry, right? And so it's the first time that I hear my mother cry and I'm feeling all weird and strange. And so I wrote down four lines on a piece of paper and I gave it to my mom and she printed it on the funeral program. And so my whole family read this thing that I wrote and everybody's coming up to me afterwards and they're like, yo man, like that was cool. I feel much better. Like I, that, that's something I'm gonna hold on to. My grandmother had eight siblings and in the course of two years, they all died. And so everybody would say, yo Jay, you think you can write my, my auntie a, a poem? You think can you write my grandma a poem? And so my first 10 pieces of writing were all about death and trying to encourage my family to feel better. And I realized in that sort of period of time that like there's power here and we're all addicted to, the, to that feeling. The feeling of affecting change, we're all addicted to, right? And that was sort of the thing that got the ball rolling. Man. And last question here at the back. Um, hi, my name is Malia. And my question is, how hard was it to develop like the female characters like Patina? Because um, you are not a female. How hard was it? <laughs> you know what? It, it was... Um, Here's, here's what I'll tell you. So, so writing Patina wasn't, it wasn't that hard for, for me. Um, I grew up around a, a, basically all women. I have an older brother, but everybody else was women, all aunties. My mom was a single mom. My whole neighborhood were young girls with single moms, right? So it was just women, women, women everywhere. I mean, it was just women everywhere. And so I'm very used to sort of being around women and sort of just being in that space. But one thing that I did, um, that I was very careful about though, was that I just didn't want to slip into certain cliches and I didn't want to slip into certain stereotypes. The one thing that I refused to do in that novel, which I'm sure if you read it, you know, is have Patina care about these boys. I, I honestly just, I honestly wanted to make sure that who she was and her identity was not tied to some young man. That, that she was who she was because she was who she was. Not because I am who I am because of what so-and-so might think of me or up against what Ghost or Lou or Sonny. It was like, no, 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 I am who I am. And what I know is that I am better than them. Right, um, and everybody else for that matter, and I and I think I think that was the one thing that was really important. So I wanted to give her some of the some of the black girl stuff that I just know so well, right? So I wanted to show her braiding her sister's hair because I grew up with girls who used to braid their sisters. I wanted to show her being being so m tough yet so caring and so responsible yet a little too responsible for her age and like these were all the black girls that I grew up around and it was just very important for me to, to give her all those things without having her slip into like and 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 right it's like I don't want to do all that all that right we don't need all that we know that already we can do we can do other things um, and so that was sort of the, the tricky part to walk that line yeah. <laughs> 
so um, can we give Jason another hand? He's so amazing. Thank you so much, Jason. Thank you. And again, thanks everyone for coming out. Jason's going to be signing books in the back. Um, you can also, is there any way if people didn't get their questions asked yeah, that they can course. email someone? You, you, can or? Always, you can always email me at jasonreynoldsbooks at gmail.com. Somebody will get the email and I'll make sure I respond. You can hit me on Twitter. I got hacked. I got a new Twitter. It's J Reynolds Books, I mm -hmm. think. Uh, and you can hit me on Instagram. I just want to say really quickly before we leave, I need all of you to know that I am, um, that even though we do this as a for a living and, you know, have had a bit of success, I need you to know that all of you who read these books, any of my books, but specifically these four books, these are the books that changed my life right these are the four books that mm -hmm. changed my life for my family and so you all have been a part of that process and I'll do the best that I can to continue to give back to you mm -hmm. I don't take that for granted so so thank you very very much for that yeah